the next panel will link to the keynotes and the questions discussed in this previous panel. The th this, uh, theme is Europe at the side of Belarus, concrete recommendations for political action to strengthen Belarus from here, from European institutions. The moderator will be Katya Krishanovskaya, who is stepping on the stage right now. She is the leader of the Belarus team at the Deutsche Welle broadcaster. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants at the Minsk Forum. The theme is the support for the democracy movement. My, the short form of my name is Katya. I am from Belarus originally, but I have been working with the broadcaster Deutsche Welle for over 10 years. We have more than 19 minutes for this panel. We want to share a lot of time with the participants to have a lively discussion and debate. This seems important to us. The participants of the debate are members of parliament on the panel, members of the Foreign Committee. From the Christian Democrats we have Mr. Knut Abraham from the Christian Democratic Union and Dr. Niels Schmidt is a member of the Social Democratic Party and the speaker for foreign affairs in the group of the Social Democratic Party in the German Parliament. Mr. Abram will have to leave us a bit early, but we will announce when he's leaving. My first question is to Mr. Dr. Schmidt. Valery Waleski pointed out in his speech that the coalition uh, announcement mentioned Belarus, which is something special. And since you belong to the parties that formed the coalition, Belarus was important when the new government in Germany was formed. We have heard already about the role of Belarus in the current situation, but we, since Maria Kolesnikova came to the intensive care unit, we hear a bit more about Belarus, but since the government was formed in Germany, we hear less and less about you, uh, Belarus. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for celebrating the Minsk Forum once again. I think it's a very important moment to speak about Belarus. I was a member of the team who discussed foreign affairs issues in the coalition talks and we integrated Belarus into the coalition uh, speech because it is very important. We don't only talk about the country when Mrs. Kalesnikova has to be brought to the intensive care. We have an intense dialogue with, of course, uh, the exiled opposition since two years after the falsified election results, we could, thanks to Mrs. to the leader of the position, um, keep Belarus in the mind of the German public. This is not normal for all the crisis. I want to point that out. It is an important interest of the Belarusian democracy and liberty movement to keep them in the minds of the German public and in the minds of the German parliament. We never cease to work for them. We always 
try to find way answers to what we have to do, it is difficult to have an impulse into the country. The opposition is in exile, we keep the contact with them. And we want to also signal that we don't forget about the political prisoners. Members of parliament of different parties have a partnership sponsoring program for the political prisoners. We have a friendship group, we call it the Parliament Circle of Friends of the, uh, Democratic Belarus and Knut Abraham as a member of the opposition takes part in, it, part in it. And we have also members of other parties in this circle of Friends of Belarus. It's a very important initiative to have an input into the German Parliament work. We can't do a lot inside Belarus, however, we could through shared efforts and with the help of Belarusians in exile, keep Belarus in the minds of the German audience and the public sphere. And I think that's uh, quite an achievement. Do you, I'd like to confirm, because this is very important, that we have a high level of attention for the destiny of Belarus, for the fate of Belarus. And we have to point out that we have to find what's the best way to proceed. And in uh, the panel discussion and the discussion with you, the participants, I'd like to know and hear from you what can we politicians and members of German parliament do to help you. It is decisive at this moment that Ukraine wins the war, because if they don't win the war, the perspectives for Belarus are lost. The way out for Belarus is closed. Not only because if the war in Ukraine is lost, this affects the German and the European action radius. So, it's not an aversion of attention if we point this out here. I have to go at 10.40 uh, because we have an initiative in the parliament about a special tribunal for war crimes. We are opposition politicians and we carry less responsibility and I really enjoy this because I can speak more freely. Also, of course, Dr. Schmidt also speaks out freely, that's clear. But I want to po point out one thing that is important to me today because I have many, many delegations from Belarus. It's very interesting that the conversations often start with one group uh, dissing the other group. And I appeal to you, we can only help if there is a unified group that we can collaborate with. I have listened with open ears to the foreign minister in exile. What he said is very important. How can we make it operational? But there are also the expectations towards the Belarusian opposition. And the second point, and that's more difficult to implement, is that to reach wider parts of the Belarusian population, and that's where the media have an important role to play, is the question, how can we improve the transmission of information and the German government has the opposition on their side in this question. You have touched on many points that I want to take up today. Let's start with the war, of course. That's the main theme everywhere. But regarding Belarusians and the role of Belarusians in this war, how are they seen in Germany? In many countries of Europe, they were labeled. In the Czech Republic, Belarusian students can't pursue their studies as freely as they 
did the past. The Baltic states have uh, made the access to their countries more difficult for Belarusians. How are Belarusians seen? Are they w fighters for democracy or are they pro-Russian? How would you answer? Well, let me answer. In August 2020, uh, which I clearly remember, I was a, an ambassador in the capital and I saw not in the capital, I was in Warsaw also. I saw thousands and thousands of Belarusian study students waiting to cast their vote in the Ulitz Rishnaya. I talked to them. I think it's a wonderful generation and they have the potential to be the future of a free and democratic Belarus. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't know really about the measures of the Czech government against Belarusian stud students. I think that's the wrong way. I think one of the central points, and I wrote it down here as you, I showed you, is to give student visa to the Belarusian students so that they can study here. That's why it was so interesting in Warsaw, people who study abroad can contribute to an enormous step forward in their own countries. I also believe that if you exclude Belarusian students from our universities, it's a bad way, wrong way. The resistance against the falsified election results is a step towards the f new nation. Belarus wants to be an independent state, wants to get out of the clause of Russia. And this independence that you see in the society, and it was very clear after the elections were forged, is not represented in the government, which supports Putin, and you can't blame the population for this uh, attitude. And therefore, you can say that the way that Belarusian President Lukashenko makes Belarus formally to a co-aggressor by supporting Putin's war doesn't mean that we should punish the population of Belarus, but that sooner or later Mr. Lukashenko should be put into, um, should be put before a, a court because he committed more than this crime. But I don't think that we should exclude Belarusian students from German or other European universities. We are very happy to fulfill the wishes of people who have to get out of Belarus because they suffer from oppression of they are in danger of being sent to prison. And we speak with the foreign ministry we, to uh, support people who have to get out of the country or want to get out of the country or people who want to come here as students. We admire the Belarusian opposition and if we have something to criticize, the criticisms should be directed towards Lukashenko and his government. May I add something? Does the Ukraine, the Belarusian public have more information about the war against Ukraine than the Russian government? Uh, po uh, population. This would explain how the government acts at the moment. The ambassador would have more information about it, but I don't have time to read their information. Uh, the answer of the moderator, there are different <coughs> interpretations, but people think 
some people think that, that the reason that there is a public opposition towards the war is the reason why Lukashenko doesn't send troops. And other people think that if Putin really insists on Belarusian troops being sent, then Lukashenko will follow the orders. I don't want to go into more details, but I thank you for signaling that there is a firm support for the opposition. In private talks, I have heard with from colleagues, uh, from journalists, from German journalists, that people in Germany don't know much or don't really know anything about what goes on in Belarus. And currently when Belarus has become practically a prison where you can't act out freely, we have to ask what do we have to do? This is something that people want to know. What do we have to do? What can we do? As a society, we have to act as a society because the government can't tell the media how they should act. And the last current teams in the media have been around the Ukrainian war and they follow up and the effects on the energy prices and so to draw attention you need a, a, a prominent and important figure to become ill or very ill. We don't really know about her state of health, but this doesn't only affect Belarus, it will affect also people from other countries. If you talk someone from Myanmar, they will be affected by the fact that people don't know about the situation in their country. What I want to say is that political attention and awareness has on, for Ukraine has the effect that Belarus becomes an important media interest. Otherwise, Belarus could easily have been totally forgotten. This is, of course, very painful, the discussion about torture and mass incarceration of political opponents should probably be discussed more broadly, but the media work in the work they, way they work. I believe that uh, what Knut Abram said is very important. We need a close relation and link. We don't need to understand that there is a close link between the war in Ukraine and the situation in Belarus, because Putin is supported by Lukashenko and the starting point, the war on Ukraine, against Ukraine, and the decline of the military uh, status, which would be the most important leverage to Uh, and the presidency of Lukashenko, because if Putin's situation is weakened, Lukashenko is weakened. And this is important to understand because it's important for our foreign policy. What we do for the Ukraine is, has an effect, a positive effect, for the situation of the civic society in Belarus. And I think this also helps to create awareness and attention for Belarus. It's a bit like uh, playing uh, pool billiard. I believe that 
Ukraine has shown us for quite some time now that the national sovereignty and their independence as a state, which they want to defend, is also the case for Belarus, which wants to defend themselves. And therefore, for Europe, it is to understand that Ukraine and Belarus are sovereign states, which is often wrongly interpreted. In Germany and in France, people often think Ukraine is part of Russia and Belarus even more so. And therefore, increasing the independence of these countries, especially now, in view of the invasion in Ukraine, it is important to understand that they are independent nations. We have to learn this, understand this, and therefore it is so difficult to put news from Belarus in the media, because many people don't understand that they are independent and therefore the war in Ukraine is the reason why we have to enlarge our glance towards east. We can't really change directly what happens in Belarus, but we can support them in their strive for independence and we have to put more attention on them. I agree with what uh, Neil Schmidt says, but let me add three points. First, I think because of the process of awareness of Ukrainian nationality and their fight for survival, we also look at the identity of Belarusians. It's positive. For instance, my kids, yesterday I also wore blue and yellow uh, clothes. And those who took to the streets, they will never forget it. You, When you ask somebody about Belarus, what happens? There are some, or actually many, who don't have a clue. But these are also people who cannot uh, differentiate between Slovakia and Slovenia, for instance. But those who know about Belarus think of something, the uh, pictures, the uh, photos of summer 2020, uh, the great people who took to the streets. And there are other positive elements. We have been talking about your countries for many years, but I recall that a couple of years ago, uh, two-thirds uh, of the people say, talked about white Russia. And you know language is important, not only the three of us, but everybody now, and also public opinion, speak of Belarus. That's a big uh, achievement. I do not want to divert from our issue, but you know the knowledge about the history of Central Europe n needs to be improved. And I can tell you this because I worked for almost four years in Poland. Things are really mixed up. And, but this also applies to parts of the German history here. Some, something needs to be done. You mentioned that Belarus is part of the war, but possibly also part of the solution. And there is one opinion that if Lukashenko 
had lost in 2020, perhaps there would not have been a war. What needs Europe to do here now to, how shall I put it, to put an end to the war soon? Perhaps one should work together with Belarus in a more active way and not just sit and wait and not talk to Lukashenko. You have just said it, the uh, outcome of the war. So when Russia will no longer be able to have an influence in Ukraine and Belarus and that Lukashenko is weakened to an extent that he can no longer keep up his power. And what we should try is to get information into the country to strengthen independent media or to use cryptocurrencies to support, for instance, the families of political prisoners. This is also part of the solution and one more challenge which we can impact only to a limited uh, amount from the outside is the high level of politicization of the society to keep up this level. And this is a major challenge because currently the possibilities to take actions are limited in Belarus. Uh, well, uh, they cannot protest or only at the price of being imprisoned. Strikes are not possible for the population at large, but the high level of politicization and the belief that political movements can change things. This is very important so that people do not deregister from the telegram channels and go back uh, to their families. Uh, I, I, could, I could understand it, but we should avoid this. The key is, however, that the aggressive imperialist policy of Russia in Ukraine must not be successful. And this will open up the option for Belarus to follow its own path without Lukashenko. This also applies to other countries like Armenia. There you see that the security guarantees by Russia lose their value because R R R Russia can no longer perform its tasks in the CSTO. So the key is the uh, out come the result of the war to defeat the imperialist intention of uh, Russia. This is very important first for Ukraine, of course, for Belarus and also for other post-Soviet countries. But how can you cooperate with Belarus? I got what you say, and many say this, that the end of the war in Ukraine will also be decisive for the fate of Belarus. But can something actively be done for Belarus to play a positive role or just wait for the end of the war, we sent out clear signals to the regime in Minsk so that participation in the war by Belarusian tro troops would further isolate the country. I think uh, this should also be off-putting 
I do not know what your opinion is. I think the biggest obstacle for Lukashenko to get directly involved in the war is the resistance in the Pielo Russian soci society. What we hear is that uh, Pielo Russians are not prepared to enter the war at the site of Russia. Many citizens seem not to be prepared to be and uh, uh, to be uh, enmeshed in this adventure. So there is support by the messages we send out from the West, but actually what is what really counts is the resistance in the uh, Belarusian society, and this is great. The uh, society is so strong that it has prevented Lukashenko to get involved in the war. Well, again, I completely agree with you, but let me take up one thing Tobias Lindner mentioned. We do not talk to the Belarusian regime. Well, the question what else can we do? I understand this question, and we ask these questions too. The regime is no partner. So, but with whom can we talk? The answer is very clear. We are talking to Mrs. Tikhanovska thinking back of the last 20 or 30 years, Mrs. Tikhanovska yeah, is for the first time a representative of the uh, of Belarus that has won the majority of the population. So whether you like it or not, it's up to you, but she is a legitimate figure. She is the only legitimate figure, so all forces should try to come to an agreement. I mean, it's not my business how the uh, Belarusian exile organizes its work, but do not underestimate the factor of legitimacy. We work with her. I also uh, work in the Parliamentarian Assembly of the Europe Council of Europe. She visited us, and she is there treated like a president, and she also talks like a president. I do not know her closely. I've met her several times, but I wanted to point this out. The issue of legitimacy uh, makes her different from many other representatives. So well was, why was her transitional cabinet not recognized? Or she also presented herself as president-elect, but also without a response. Now I take on the hat of a diplomat. It's always a bit difficult to recognize exile governments. Of course, it also has uh, reasons uh, enshrined in status law, but I agree with you that we treat this transitional cabinet politically like an acting cabinet. And uh, when it comes to the uh, political 
sites and you just uh, re represented him, the representative for foreign affairs. So this role should be mentioned. And when we focus on this, this makes dialogue easier. Mr. Schmidt, what is your opinion? I do not mean that it should be recognized immediately, and it's also not my opinion that uh, counts, but the fact whether Mrs. Tiranovskaya is treated as a president, but at the same time you do not recognize it, doesn't this mean that you do not want to irk Lukashenko? But uh, Knut Abraham has pointed out the problems from the perspective of a diplomat. Honestly speaking, we ma made a rather difficult experience where we uh, recognized Gaido in Venezuela. Uh, it was also a transitional president and it was not helpful, also not helpful to Venezuela. So the, uh, we are a bit cautious to take this step of formal recognition, but we have made steps that allow Mrs. Uh, Tishanevskaya and her cabinet to uh, be uh, uh, in the limelight. Many things you could discuss with a government like uh, cooperation agreements do not work in this case because you should also not raise expectations that cannot be fulfilled. Lukashenko is in Minsk in uh, in the midst of the state, so it is unavoidable to uh, deal with certain things with him. And it's also good that we have our ambassador on the ground, so somebody who can get a certain feel of the mood and uh, is still in contact and he can do something. Of course, he will not organize uh, the toppling of the regime and he is also quite limited in what he can do. But I can live well with the current situation and it was very helpful that this so-called cabinet has helped the opposition to come together. So it's also very beneficial for our contact. So a lot has already been done and the last step still requires an impetus which is not yet there. But we are on a good course. You have already mentioned that you expect the opposition to remain united. Well, sometimes there are some squabbles or it will, they do not present a united picture. But what are your practical expectations? What proposals should the opposition uh, do for Europe to continue to support it. Well, I can only give you some classical examples. We, what we all need is uh, up-to-date assessment of the situation in Belarus. And what we need is we need a high frequency of talks, so a kind of visit diplomacy. Belarus is part of the European family and the exile government can prove this by making their stances 
clear, like an acting government. So when Europe meets, then Belarus should always be part of it. I'm not talking about the European Council. This is not possible because of legal things. But in reality, in the political reality, Belarus needs to be a part. I see this as a big task. And to be very precise, I do not want the uh, opposition to be one and the same, but they should uh, agree. Do you share this? Well, uh, you united or in agreement and visible. Well, the point is now to create a democratic Belarus and then there will be uh, elections. This is also uh, the uh, 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 goal of Mrs. Tishanovskaya and then there will be different political forces in parliament. But currently the opposition needs to agree that they want to create a democratic Belarus. And actually, I do not want to give a lot of advice because I really respect the courage and the stamina of the opposition. The only thing is I would like to encourage the opposition not to give in to the feeling that nothing can be achieved. It, it, something will be achieved. Often a parallel is drawn to Solidarność in Poland. The uh, Solidarność war was uh, prohibited and uh, the government seemed to be victorious. Uh, there were also persecution, etc. And then uh, seven years later, there were free elections and uh, Solidarność took power. Well, you know, two years are over now in Belarus, so perhaps uh, we will have achieved it in a couple of years. We should not allow the feeling that everything is for nothing, that we do not make a lot of progress. Currently, we do not make a lot of progress. That's correct, but it will not be in vain. And I'm convinced of this. Permit me to point out something where I may not have the newest information because I didn't have the time for it. In Germany, in the time that we were split into countries, we had a group which documented the crimes against political prisoners that took place then. And many people, and I am one of them, imagine that a similar thing could be made. We could found a centralized investigative committee to let the last in the chain of command of the torturers know and understand that in the end they will be brought to justice. That was really important in the case of the German Democratic Republic, the GDR. The torturers have to be aware that in the end they will be brought to justice and they will be held responsible. Of course, from this stage it's easy to say and for me, however, it is something important. I, I know that Carl Bildt and the Swedes have worked on that. I don't have the newest information, however. I have to bring myself up to date. And uh, permit me, I have to leave now the stage because I have to go to the Special Committee on Ukraine 
In the last government, the German government, Heiko Maas, there was an initiative to bring into place a mechanism to collect data and proof. It was about Syria and that, at that time. Heiko Maas was the minister in charge. We could use this principle. I don't know if there is another person here from the foreign ministry. They could bring us up to speed. It is an European. It should be a European initiative, Ms. Krishanovskaya says, and Mr. Niels says we have to bring a, an initiative similar to the uh, Nazi, uh, Nazi um, tribunal after the Second World War. Chris Katya points out. I want to bring something into discussion for about political prisoners. You are a sponsor for a political prisoner, Mr. Patin, who was convicted to several years. Europe doesn't want to talk with Belarus about political prisoners. How do you live with the fact that your sponsored political prisoner is facing uh, 13 years in prison. The question is, how can we negotiate with Mr. Lukashenko? In the past, there were some initiatives where we tried to make a parcel to talk about with him, uh, conditioning the talks with the liberation of political prisoners. It worked for a time. We have to say, I have a colleague, Mr. Wiese, who was the envoy of the German government for the collaboration with the civic societies of the Eastern countries, the Russian Federation and Asian countries. He was the envoy for Belarus. I wanted to increment the collaboration by increasing the economical uh, incentives, but after seeing what Lukashenko does, the base for this uh, kind of collaboration has been lost because he is not prepared to give political liber liberalization initiatives. Give, way, give space to liberalization of this society. And the way that he, the Lukashenko, supports Putin's war in Ukraine, we have huge question marks regarding whether Lukashenko is prepared to move some, in some ways. We, want, we don't seem to be able to liberate political prisoners. I, I myself write letters. We, I don't know what happens to the letters that I write to my uh, sponsor person who is in prison. He, I get some answers showing where he tells me that he feels strong and his wife, or rather through contact with his lawyer, they have some kind of contact, but his situation is quite dramatic. And after hearing of Maria Kalev's in cover, we know how difficult, well, how dangerous it actually is to be in prison in Belarus at the moment. But we maintain our position that all political prisoners have to be freed, and we try to get this done, but I don't see really how we can get an agreement on that with Mr. Lukashenko. Katarina says, in the past, I don't think there were some kind of signs that a dictator would become a nice person suddenly and liberate prisoners, because that's not how they act. And this aspect I'd like 
and permit me to find for the right formulation. I'd like to know it won't happen if we if if you don't say we want all political prisoners free, otherwise we don't budge. Why don't you take up this stance? The answer, the difficulty is that we have a different situation. In the past, we could give Lukashenko an incentive by saying, collaborate with us. This could be economically interesting for yourself. It strengthens your position. You can uh, develop your industry with the IT sector, which increased in Minsk. You would become a bit more independent from Russia. But Lukashenko doesn't have that incentive anymore. He decided to si take sides with Putin. He decided against continuing the collaboration with us, so we don't have leverage. The question from the moderator and uh, the threat with sanctions, the answer, I, yeah, well, but I don't see that he will free the political prisoners because he's scared of losing his grip on power. And Lukashenko is not interesting anymore to engage in closer relations with the West because he was forced to side with Putin to secure his own power. And therefore, the situation has changed. In the pa Before, we could use incentives to liberate political prisoners. And later, Lukashenko very slowly reacted. There were new laws implemented against rowdies. They created new possibilities to put, send people to prison. Also, they criminal, penalized uh, drug use. The question of the death penalty remains without being resolved until today. And so we had difficulties in the past and it's more difficult today because Lukashenko, be it, be it uh, voluntarily or not, went totally to the side of Putin. The question is, I'd like to talk about the support that had been undertaken until today. What worked best uh, from the measures that Germany undertook? That's a good question. I think what works very easily is to support the opposition in the exile. We are more free there. We can give them funding directly. We have a direct contact with them. What has much more difficult is to support the civic society in the country because they are under surveillance. They Room for maneuver is even more restricted. We have a way to bring funding into the country. Like I mentioned before, cryptocurrency, for instance, is a medium to do that. But what we can do is, together with the exiled opposition, is to keep up the awareness and the attention for the situation in Belarus. And I think this is what is decisive and what we will need in the future as well. Question, how far is Germany flexible in regards to collaborating with the exiles? Because many people who are, have been labeled as extremists and terrorists cannot um, renew their passports, so their visas, and there is a new uh, incoming law that people might lose their citizenship, so in the end they will be stateless. Is Germany ready to react to that? Answer. Belarus is not the first country that acts this way with their own citizens. Syria is a country that has done that. And in Germany, we have a procedure for that. We give them um, substitute documentation. And if they spend long enough in our country, they can acquire German nationality or citizenship. 
but only a part of them will do that. There is also a judicial way that ensures that people are not left without any documentation and especially they won't be forced to go into an embassy or a consulate. I don't know if there is some representative from the Ministry of Interior Affairs here present, but there are certain procedures to ensure that they get documentation. So there is an instrument for that? Yes. And this applies for all foreigners who are in this kind of situations. It's for people from any origin. He may be from, from Syria or Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzia, maybe not. But people who are from a country where, as an opposition member, they cannot go into the consulate or embassy, they can apply for a German documentation. And uh, in respect of, with regards to visas, yes, we have a humanitarian visa that that is, uh, there is a um, common understanding between the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Interior Affairs to raise the number of visas that will be given. But it is clear that once you leave the country, you won't be able to go back. You have to be aware of that because visas are for people who want to leave the country or are forced to leave the country. So that's why we give out the humanitarian visa and it's uh, widely used. I don't know the exact current numbers. If there are problems, we have to get in contact with the Ministry of Interior, but Heiko Maas had an agreement with the Interior Ministry about the humanitarian visa. The number was too small, you're right. But the number was increased. We have a new minister at the moment, and that helps. And if that's still too little, we can increase the number of humanitarian visa even more in the future. Of course, there are certain reasons. Many people prefer to go to Poland or Lithuania, maybe for linguistic reasons, and we try to support them. But of course, in these cases, people leave their countries for for a long time at least. In the past, Belarus wanted to travel to see Europe, to see how it is to live in a democracy, and that helped to promote uh, the civic society. But this uh, doesn't seem to be important for German politicians, politics anymore. Yes, well, in the past, this was a motivation, especially on EU level, to liberalize the expenditure of visa. But under the current situation, the government, the de facto government of Lukashenko, I don't think it is possible because Lukashenko might use it to point out that he was the one who made it possible for Belarusians to f travel freely. I don't see it pos as a possible thing today. In principle, it is, right? Uh, freedom of travel promotes, as you said, uh, democracy, but I think countries with difficult situations and authoritarian regimes is, is a good thing because people, by knowing the West, understand that it's not a bad and decadent country. I don't know what the rhetoric is in their home countries, but I think we have to make it possible that not only the elites benefit from these uh, visa and this freedom of movement. I think the Belar people of Belarus needs this kind of support to hear that Europe is on their side and supports them because 
during the protests, uh, the one of the things that you heard w would have been that uh, Europe doesn't welcome them. Maybe Europe does have to undertake smaller steps and communicate better about it to understand how it supports Belarus. Or we should say what is this is what Belarus can achieve if it becomes a more democratic country. And this is what we speak about when we speak with Ms. Tihanovskaya and her, her co-fighters. If Belarus opens, Europe will react totally different. But under Mr. Lukashenko, this is not possible. And therefore, we hear from the opposition also that they prefer us not to do anything with Mr. Lukashenko as a partner. So currently, we can't give any advantages. We want to send out a clear signal. We understand that Belarus people don't want Mr. Lukashenko. And therefore, many things that we would like to do in collaboration between EU and Belarus on different fields is not possible. And it will be only possible to act with a different government, with a new government. And we want to make it clear, you, the Belarusian people, can trust and have faith in us. The European family are ready to help you economically, politically, <coughs> financially, and with uh, giving out visas more easily. Question. You said for Belarus you need a longer uh, timeline. How long do you think we will have to wait? And the support, especially the financial and political support, how long will it be possible to help? I think, essentially, as I said, it depends on the situation regarding the war against Ukraine. And I pointed out the parallels to the Solidarność. We will see it. I don't and not have to wait until we are 100 years old. I think what we saw in its early beginnings will maybe last to grow, uh, last come to fruition maybe four years, six years, ten years. And as about the financial support, as we can't spend anything in the moment, it doesn't cost us much. Are we ready in the future when there is a change, a political change, to open our markets, allow investments? Then that's the time when the big question rises. Are we ready to move on? and to go into the country. But in the moment, the question of the financial support is not what is really problematic for us, because we could, we could go on for decades, because it doesn't cost us anything at the moment. And it's a, he's laughing. We have to be ready to act, because Belarus is a neighbor, not direct neighbor of Germany, but it is a neighbor of the EU. And we have to be ready to help also with financial means. Now, thank you, Mr. Schmidt. I want to open the floor to the audience. Remember that you are asked to use the mic and to show, look into the camera. I'm Frank of the German Association of Trade Unions. 
I wanted to come back to the issue of political refugees and the procedures we use, well, humanitarian visa, and we also helped some people from Belarus to get out of the country. It exists, but actually it doesn't do justice to the needs. Uh, it takes quite a long time. Uh, what we should do is to think about procedures that allow people to get out of the country quickly so that they are recognized here in Germany. And a second point is to open-mindedness towards Biela uh, Russians in Europe. This is very important. Couldn't we do things we didn't dare to do in the past? Couldn't we say there is a contingent for 50,000 people from Belarus? Now they can come now and it helps the people and, well, perhaps we also drain some uh, brains from the country and we tell all them once Lukashenko is no longer in place, then you go back and uh, you get the incentive. So we will spend all the taxes you paid here. Uh, so, to send out a signal, we haven't forgotten Belarus. We are open for people. So, these were, are two different issues. The uh, procedure, which is quite complex, and the other one, uh, the openness and uh, how welcome they are. Well, as to the procedure, I don't think I can judge it. I think when push comes to shove and there is danger for the life of uh, the people, then they can get out. I mean, the fact that the numbers for humanitarian visa was too low, that's correct. We increased the number. And if there is a need, we would also increase it again. Perhaps somebody in the room knows more and can answer the uh, uh, question as to the border issue. There are no borders for paragraph 22. Each individual case is registered in the embassy and the procedure is started there as to getting out of the country quickly. Well, there are also Schengen visa that can uh, be granted. So a short time visa can uh, be granted first. And uh, I'm Alina Kovsom. May I take up one point here? The question many people uh, in Belarus or from Russia have, they uh, uh, flee the country, go to Turkey, etc., try to get a, a visa. And the standard answer is they could, should go back to the country to apply for visa. That's impossible. But according to paragraph 22, it is possible to use the representation in Tbilisi, etc. So the situation has improved. I'm not up to date. If this was the case, I would be very happy. Yes, things have been improved, and I would uh, recommend the individuals to come to us. So you can go to a consulate or an embassy in a third country. The only problem is that the general consulate in Istanbul 
is really stretched to its limits. And actually, this is also a problem in many other consulates, but this is the case uh, unrelated to the uh, war in Ukraine. We have increased the number of people working in the consulate and in other uh, offices. We try to accelerate the process. But you know, this is uh, a slow process. Uh, Piela, a Russian who uh, gets to Istanbul, may be unlucky to have a long waiting period in the consulate in uh, Turkey. But the individual can go to the embassy. So thank you very much. As to your second point, to invite 50,000 uh, Russians to come here, to work here, is politically difficult given 100,000 Ukrainian refugees that get jobs relatively quickly and given the problem to find accommodations in the municipalities. Well, I had some problems to invite a lot of Belarusians, but what is possible is to invite people in the medical and uh, care sector uh, uh, we could think whether we uh, do this for Belarus, but the question is then, uh, can we do this with the current authorities? And I'm not quite sure whether the opposition wants to get uh, many experts out. I mean, of course, those who are threatened they should be received, but we should give it a lot of thought what criteria to apply and in how far it makes sense given the societal structure in Belarus. The next question. I am a gender researcher and I actually have two questions for you. The first one uh, regarding to the topic of opposition unity. Um, are there somebody and something who rep represent themselves as a part of uh, Belarusian opposition with whom German government decided not to work anymore and stop any relations? That's my first question. And the second one, uh, actually regarding to the previous discussion, uh, sometimes again, unfortunately, we still have uh, cases uh, where some embassy workers, uh, uh, especially the workers in embassy in uh, uh, Georgia uh, behave themselves extremely rude uh, uh, regarding to Belarusian citizens and even Belarusian political prisoners. So my question here, uh, do uh, like Germany or maybe some uh, embassies uh, conducted any trainings to embassy workers to uh, like uh, understand the situation in the region? Thank you so much. Also to the second point. As to the second point, well, I'm not able to comment. I would ask the foreign uh, ministry whether there are unfriendly people in the different embassies or whether there is a lack of sensitivity. I mean, uh, they are uh, stretched uh, and have a high workload. This I can not exclude, but if you have uh, something more concrete, just uh, tell me. M Monica Lenhardt, uh, head of the department for uh, Russian partnerships, I would say all our consulates 
as far as I know, try to do their very best and to advise people. I mean, of course, they have a very high workload. We hear this from Tbilisi because many Russians went there, so the, the uh, embassy and their services were really stretched to the limit. So actually, I would reject that the people there treat Piela Russians and Russians uh, in a bad way. I took note of it, but normally you, uh, we provide uh, advice, and I think the people try to do their very best. As to contacts with the opposition, I am not aware that we exclude certain opposition groups from our contacts. And as far as I know, nobody stood out negatively if uh, there were kinds of terrorists, of course, then we would be cautious. But I don't, I'm not aware of something like this with regard to Belarus. As from my discussions uh, with the opposition, I can say that we have many discussions with them, some in Vilnius, some when they are in Berlin, and I think all parliamentarians act this way, not excluding anybody. Well, uh, one practical point, paragraph 22, it can also be applied outside of Belarus, but it's more difficult in EU countries. But even in a non-EU country, in Montenegro, a Belarusian was rejected because it was said, we must not make an exemption for Belarusians because you are no Russians. We have seen this that for Russian opposition measures are available. For instance, the program for Russian journalists, but the uh, colleagues from Belarus didn't in enjoy these privileges they are subject to the uh, normal rules. Uh, well, talking to the uh, colleagues from the Foreign Office, I know the issue is being discussed and improvements are to be made, but currently it is very difficult. I just wanted to point out that uh, often people from Belarus and Russia are treated the same way. And I think it's very difficult. It was already difficult, you mentioned it too, to keep Belarus on the agenda. And the feeling is now that we are pushed aside by what happens in Russia. And well, actually, this is quite a wide field. We should look more at the history. Also, the 23rd of August 1939 to understand uh, the situation better. The 23rd of August is a European holiday, but it's not of such a high importance in Germany. We should strengthen our awareness of our historical responsibility, and it makes a difference compared to Myanmar and Syria. Uh, as Germans, we have a stronger responsibility towards Belarus than for Russia, for instance. And this would also help us to get 
uh, more support from the German public. And one last point, a practical consequence would be to have separate support programs for the region. There was just a project for support of researchers from uh, Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine. And it was so difficult because there were completely different requirements as to security, etc. So I would wish to see separate programs for Belarus, Russia, and Ukraine. And you know, at the practical level, uh, we, there were, was then tension uh, among the participants. The last point, the war in Ukraine has been mentioned, but what role does Belarus play? What are the implications and a horror scenario for Belarus would be when negotiations take place uh, once the uh, war in Ukraine is over and Belarus is used as a kind of pawn. So, I mean, uh, it must be very clear that uh, the uh, Belarus uh, regime uh, is a perpetrator while the population is uh, a victim and the uh, uh, relations between Ukraine and Belarus are very difficult. The Ukrainian uh, government also fears to cross a red line. I think nobody needs to explain Germans why to be afraid of red lines. And perhaps one could support Kiev more saying, you uh, support the Belarus uh, opposition and we support you that it doesn't is a red line that you cross. We have time for one more question. Uh, and Mr. Schmidt, would you like to answer to uh, the questions raised? Yes, the Foreign Ministry has taken notes because there were many issues that were raised there. I'd like to take on the idea of the culture of remembrance. Belarus is even less in the uh, German awareness President Steinmeier could improve the situation regarding Ukraine with his visits there. And when we were able to uh, travel to Belarus, or when it was still helpful to travel there, we tried to improve the uh, media awareness in Germany. Of course, there is a relation of responsibility between Germany and Belarus. And when we talk about human rights defense and human rights situations, uh, we have a big, bigger uh, responsibility in Belarus and in other regions of the world. I am representative of the minority in Prague and the Czech Republic. I have a sh situation speak about Belarusian opposition when there is no uh, legitimate government in the country or it would be more correct to speak about Belarusian democratic forces political forces and maybe this correct terminology will help these forces to be more united thank you Ja, das ist so ein bisschen äh, eine schwer beantwortbare Frage was wirkungsvoller ist ich glaube it is difficult to answer in with respect of Lukashenko. It is legitimate to speak about the opposition. It's not the formal opposition in parliament. You're right there. I don't have a problem to speak of democratic forces because 
The aim is to support the democratic forces in Belarus. I don't think it is the aim to strengthen one representative more than the other. Maybe I should have, shouldn't have spoken of opposition if I did that too often, more of opposition forces. There is something like calling us the friends of the democratic forces in Belarus. The collaboration with Belarus is put on hold because we don't want to send out a clear signal. The parliamentary circle is not called parliamentary circle oppositional Belarus, but democratic Belarus. I won't speak about opposition, but of democratic forces in future. Thank you for the hint. The um, to come to the conclusion, we can expect a longer collaboration for the support of the democratization of Belarus. There are reactions from the government with uh, an ease in the procedures of visas and to help people come to Europe. And also, it is clear that Belarus has to be understood better, to be seen as an independent country, independent from Russia, independent also from the situation in the Ukraine. Thank you for the interesting debate. Thank you to the uh, panel and to the audience as well.